voy a dar para pa ese espacio. Otro compacto. Oh, pero si, pues, si se pone otro compacto, hay que hacer otra tontería. Ok, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the new session of the online meetings for the Worldwide Energy Network, Distinguished Lecture Program of CERC. Uh, today, we have the presentation of Professor Frede Blatter from Albor University. Professor Blatter is a full professor uh, of power electronics and drives in Albor University. His uh, research interests include power electronics and its applications such as in wind turbines, PV system, reliability, harmonics, and adjustable speed drives. He has published more than 600 journal papers in the field of power electronics and its applications. Uh, he has received several prizes uh, for some papers for distinguished service at the Bills. And also he has been editor in chief of several IEEE transactions, as well as distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Power Electronics Society. He has been nominated also by Thomson Reuters uh, to be between um, the most 250 cited researchers in engineering in the world. Professor Freyer thank you very much for accept our invitation. And now the microphones and the screen Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me. So let's do the technical things here first. Uh, so are you okay here with this? Yes. yes. It looks fine. Yeah, super. Yeah, hello everybody. <clears throat> thank you for coming here and uh, listen to my presentation here today. Uh, I have been asked to uh, give uh, some contributions to uh, the topic of uh, photovoltaic system, uh, uh, the power electronics we are applying in that context, and then also uh, uh, the reliability around uh, those uh, uh, systems. So uh, this, this is uh, my topic for, for the uh, next 45 minutes to uh, one hour, but first, uh, I will just uh, share with you where I'm uh, sitting uh, uh, today. Uh, we are uh, located here in the north of Germany, uh, close in uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, we are in the Nordic uh, countries. And uh, uh, Denmark, as such, you can see enlarged here with uh, Copenhagen located on an island. Uh, and uh, all were located on, on the mainland connected to, uh, to Germany here. Aalborg University, uh, where I have been working for many years uh, uh, until now, uh, is a university which is becoming close to 50 years. And uh, just uh, one, one comment to our characteristic, uh, we are relatively strong, uh, we are strong engineering uh, as such. One of the reasons our engineering uh, activities are strong is that our study programs, uh, they are always, uh, uh, let's say, uh, taking uh, uh, the approach of working with problems. Uh, in that sense that half of the time the students are spent on doing uh, problem solving in uh, project uh, groups and half of the time they are taking uh, lectures. And uh, they do that all the time from semester one to the end semester. Uh, and that is what we call the problem-based learning Olber uh, teaching model. So if you have a chance uh, and will try something different, uh, but very powerful educational program, then uh, come to our university. Uh, here you can see uh, some of the figures. This is in the good weather for the moment. Uh, it's uh, a little bit dark because of the position of uh, the earth. Uh, but in the summertime, uh, we have a lot of daylights, and you see here uh, different uh, uh, pictures from the campus. Maybe I should mention here that uh, we have campus in Olber. This is the main campus, I guess, 18, 17,000 students. But we also have campus in Esbjerg, and we all have a campus in uh, Copenhagen. 
So uh, just the uh, Department of Energy, uh, where uh, uh, I'm sitting, uh, is uh, uh, located in uh, the east part of the Aalborg University campus. Uh, uh, no, in the west part of the Aalborg University East campus, I have to say. And uh, th this is uh, the buildings uh, associated with the uh, Department of Energy activities where we have this uh, unique uh, position that uh, we have a lot of uh, lab facilities uh, placed here. And then we have a, a staff uh, facilities located at uh, this place here. So now uh, today the topic is uh, photovoltaic. So if you look carefully on those uh, figures here, you can see that we have some uh, PV panels on, on the roof here. We also have uh, PV panels here. And I will say, I think we have for more than uh, 15 years been recording uh, we have been recording the irradiation characteristic, the temperature characteristic of, uh, of uh, this site, and uh, the, the data are uh, in general uh, available for everybody if they want uh, to uh, have that. But we, we cover, uh, let's say, medium voltage, high voltage, uh, low voltage, reliability packing. We cover many things in, uh, in, uh, in our lab facilities, which are very, very uh, unique. So if we look at the Department of Energy uh, and also putting into the context of uh, my presentation today, I said we work with general about energy production, distribution, uh, consumption and uh, general control where the power is uh, produced here in the classical way by power station, uh, transmitted, uh, distributed, and uh, then also uh, uh, consumed in a, in a in a, in a smart way, if we can use that word. Uh, this site here is the electrical site. We also have uh, the thermal uh, site uh, uh, to the left in, uh, in, in this diagram, because many of our uh, power stations, if they are there still uh, left, uh, there we are using the waste heat for heating up uh, uh, big cities in a, in a common uh, heating uh, system. Uh, but what you can see here is, of course, uh, <clears throat> in the electrical part, we are applying a lot of uh, power conversion in order to make the process uh, way uh, efficient. And uh, we have had a tradition for <clears throat> a long time to be working with this, uh, starting with the uh, motor drives application, but, but then later uh, we have moved much more into the renewable generation, like illustrated here by starting wind turbines, uh, photovoltaics, also uh, storage uh, technologies. And now, of course, a lot of focus is uh, put on uh, two things. One is the electrification of the transportation, as well as how to make, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, usage uh, of uh, the potential of hydrogen in uh, different uh, processes. Because for energy intensive areas, we we need uh, we need hydrogen or some uh, chemical uh, based uh, carriers. Uh, we work in research programs. This is the last one before I come to my uh, to my uh, full uh, presentation uh, and technical presentation. But one of the research uh, programs uh, we have this is uh, on a PV system where we work on uh, yeah uh, grid integration, reliability, uh, storage as to how to put this together, fault detection on on the panel, uh, and uh, also. Uh, let's say inspection of uh, panels and here you can see a little bit more closer look at uh, one of the places where we have uh, the uh, pv panels and if you are interested in more details about this then uh, go into this uh, website and we we are contributing to uh, let's say different parts of the sustainable uh, development goals okay so but uh, that that was just a general introduction to uh, uh, to the department where I maybe should mention that uh, we have around uh, 140 uh, PhD students. Uh, I would say 60% of them are working with one way or the other related uh, electrical engineering and power electronics uh, activities. But for a long time, uh, we have uh, been uh, working on uh, reliability and uh, power conversion uh, and uh, renewables is a very natural uh, place uh, to, to look at this. Uh, and especially PV, also if you see the rapid growth of uh, PV systems uh, globally, this is a very important uh, part to be uh, to be aware of. And in that context, let me touch on uh, uh, the demands uh, to uh, what we call levelized cost of energy. 
and uh, why uh, reliability is uh, uh, important. Uh, also, what kind of failures do we see in uh, PV systems and uh, what kind of uh, where as a failures come because we have uh, failures in the components and the components fail because uh, they, they become aged over time and uh, they are weared out. But uh, in general, what we all the time uh, target uh, is uh, what we can say to to lower the cost of energy as uh, more low it becomes as more competitive it becomes compared to other energy uh, sources and if you look at uh, the, the photovoltaic uh, technology it's very interesting to see what has happened in, since uh, 2010 uh, uh, with what we call levelized cost of energy figures of merit for for different uh, let's say applications where we are seeing the pv uh, these are data uh, uh, not 100% updated, but anyway, uh, still uh, valid from Department of Energy and uh, US, where it's uh, separated into, uh, let's say, residential, commercial, and then also utility scale uh, uh, activities and uh, the cost of uh, energy. And uh, what is uh, interesting to see here is the, the cost of residential, uh, let's say, was 50 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, then we can see that in uh, in uh, 2020 we have reduced it to 10 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, and in uh, 2030 it's reduced to half again. So this is really a significant drop in terms of uh, cost of uh, energy. If we then uh, look at uh, commercial where the scale is higher, and if we look at utility, we see the same uh, figure of merit, but just it becomes even uh, cheaper in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, cost of energy. And just comparing uh, here, uh, the cost of energy uh, 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 is really competitive with what, what we know around. So, uh, so therefore, uh, Cost of energy is uh, important to, uh, to, to look at. And uh, if, if, if we uh, talk about this, the reliability of uh, the panels are important because if they can last for a longer time, uh, then the cost of energy will go down without any specific maintenance. If the inverters will go down in cost, uh, will uh, uh, operate, let's say, 50% longer, uh, then uh, we will also have that uh, the cost of energy will uh, go down. So, so reliability really is uh, important. And if we look at uh, the uh, row uh, of uh, such system we have here to the left, uh, uh, let's say uh, we have in general the system uh, with panels, uh, converter, and uh, then we have uh, the grid interconnection where you can see uh, listed up uh, a lot of different uh, figure of merits which are important in terms of uh, designing and uh, operating as a, for the panels, uh, getting as much energy out of it, control, uh, monitoring and diagnosis are important aspects also when we talk about uh, dealing with uh, reliability. If you look at the converters uh, we have here, controllability, efficiency, reliability, these are really key uh, metrics. Uh, thermal management, energy management uh, in, in uh, collaboration with other parts of the system, protection, uh, monitoring and safety, communication, and so on. Th these are very important aspects of uh, the inverter system. And in that context, uh, each component has its uh, function and also has its uh, metrics in terms of uh, uh, reliability when we are uh, starting this. And then we have to the uh, to the to the grid side where we want to feed uh, power into it, and uh, there uh, power quality, uh, power flow controllability, uh, and then uh, different let's say performance characteristic to be able to uh, to provide uh, to the grid system in order to have a, a reliable grid are also expected uh, uh, like illustrated here grid forming control inertia provision. Uh, fault by through operation and when we have fault we should be able to stay connected uh, to the uh, to the grid system if we look at where are the failures in uh, in a system like this uh, in a pv system 
Uh, then uh, there are different statistics. Uh, this one here now is uh, 10 years old, uh, but uh, still a representative one. And there are also in the last five years different uh, new statistics. And all of them uh, come with the conclusion that, uh, that, uh, 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 that the inverter has a relatively high uh, failure rate and then affecting what we call uh, the levelized uh, cost of energy. So, uh, so what you can see here are the uh, different uh, components which are failing in a, in a PV system where uh, the inverter is the dominant uh, component, but there are also AC subsystem, uh, support structure, DC subsystem, and so on, which all uh, are accounting for what we call the levelized cost of uh, energy. But if we look at the failure rates uh, out of all the failures we have in the system, we can see that 45% of uh, in this statistics uh, are, are saying that this is uh, this is coming from the inverter, and the impact on the energy loss, uh, so the loss of production, uh, we do not have. This is 35%. Uh, so also a significant because it takes time to do the maintenance and uh, also repairing uh, the system. And this, this figure of merit has uh, not significantly been, uh, been changed uh, if I look at it uh, with some uh, recent uh, reports. So in the worst case, uh, we can say that uh, 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 the reliability matters and uh, a situation like this is what we to the left is absolutely what we do not like to see and fortunately it way very rarely happens to this can also be a lightning stroke uh, which uh, is, is a part of that uh, but uh, uh, but in general you can say just a simple component can be very critical for for the whole system and especially in in the case that uh, fires and so on will be seen uh, this is not to illustrate that uh, things are very, very bad, but just to say that in, in, when we're dealing with the electrical system, there, there is a risk of having, uh, uh, let's say, a failure, in, uh, uh, criti very critical failures in, uh, in the system. And uh, just a few components or one component could be enough to uh, trigger this. But uh, uh, reputation will also affect if the reliability is not uh, okay, and uh, of course, the cost of uh, energy. So when we talk about uh, failure and reliability engineering, we we have a what we call a bathtub curve, which uh, typically characterizing a component or a system uh, uh, to a certain degree. Uh, where uh, uh, down here we have the operating time, and then we have the failure, uh, the failure rates uh, uh, over uh, over time. Uh, where uh, this is looks like a bathtub curve, right? In the beginning, we have a higher a number of failures uh, compared with when we are in operation. Typically, we will have a constant failure rate, but still there will be uh, failures of the system. And then uh, as time is uh, passing, then uh, way out failures will, uh, uh, will happen because uh, some of the components uh, are becoming weaker and weaker. And then we will also see uh, failures uh, because of that. But, uh, but uh, the commission and Tribu, there are extra failures uh, of uh, different reasons. Uh, uh, and then uh, in normal operation, there are typical random failures uh, where uh, we cannot say it's especially this and this because of the way out, but components have, let's say, a certain uh, risk of uh, failing. And then when the time is passing, then uh, the, uh, the components uh, one by one uh, due to different uh, stressors, they will, uh, they will see an uh, increasing uh, uh, failure rate. So uh, what that fundamentally can be described with, if we look away from, let's say, uh, the first part of the bathtub curve is that uh, the way we, we do our design of uh, PV inverter systems is that uh, we, we have a certain load variation. These are the panels. I think you can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, also see this in front of you, that this is the, the, the production, this is the irradiation, the power available, which can be characterized uh, like this uh, with a certain uh, probability. Uh, and uh, then uh, it looks like this. Then uh, we can say we are designing the inverter uh, uh, and uh, uh, it has a certain strength. It should be able to cope with uh, the power the load is uh, seeing. 
but uh, it will also have a certain distribution because the components themselves uh, do not have the same, uh, let's say, strength. And so there are variation in that uh, respect. And if there is a little overlap here, uh, then we would have a failure already from, uh, from uh, the beginning. But uh, then over time, uh, what is uh, affecting the, uh, the, both the loads, uh, but especially the strength of the, of the converter system are uh, the irradiation uh, so the, uh, and also the temperature uh, will affect uh, the load. Uh, no, no, no doubt about uh, this, but also the temperature will affect the strength of the, uh, of the components because of uh, thermal uh, impact. Uh, but other factors uh, will, will also be able to uh, wearing out uh, the components we are applying in the system, like uh, humidity, uh, maybe even a vibration could be uh, present. Uh, there can also be a cosmic ray, which is going to uh, affect and uh, weaken the, the inverter. So in, uh, in that respect, uh, uh, what happens is that maybe the load variation will be the same. It can be a little bit less because of some of the parameters up there. There can also be degradation of the panels. Uh, but, uh, but the strength is becoming uh, less. And what we will then see over time is that we have an overlap between uh, uh, the load and uh, the strength, and we will have uh, failures. And they are going to intensify as uh, time is uh, going. So uh, uh, after five years, maybe not any overlap. After 10 years, some overlap. After 15 years, more overlap. And after 20 years, maybe a significant overlap. And we have a relatively high uh, failure rate of uh, the system. So uh, what, what do we do in order to, uh, let's say, uh, look as a, to, to design then uh, the converters uh, and have a certain uh, reliability? And uh, yeah, uh, it seems from an electronics perspective, we for many years have been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, assessing system and to do, for example, uh, failure mode and effect analysis to, uh, to analyze uh, a complicated uh, system. And when we have analyzed uh, this uh, complicated system, uh, then uh, we can go into a mode of uh, yeah, design for reliability. And uh, the, the way this uh, typically works is which components are the most uh, critical in our design, uh, what kind of failures uh, will happen over time, and, uh, and uh, the reason they are happening, and so which failure mechanisms are really important, and so the failure mechanism, how are they uh, uh, initiated, if you can say, so what are the major stress and strength uh, parts? Then uh, there, are, there are two roads, like I showed in the diagram before, and so uh, we have to look at uh, the stress, and so what is the stress of the system? How is the operational conditions? Uh, uh, like your radiation, how is uh, the, uh, uh, the the physical stress on on uh, on the components, which of course will depend on the power, but also the thermal uh, layout, if we can say so. Uh, and we have to analyze this over a long time in order to to assess it uh, for all uh, the conditions uh, the system is uh, seeing. So this is a stress analysis for the converter we are designing. And then uh, on the other hand, we do uh, strength uh, analyzing and strength uh, modeling, looking at uh, component level strength, uh, get data for it, both uh, testing. And uh, when we have the testing, then we maybe have also a, a degradation model or something like that. And uh, those two together enable us to say something about uh, the characteristic of the stress uh, we are as a, do the reliability mapping of uh, the whole thing. Uh, uh, in that context, uh, we know we are dealing with systems which are not the same all the time. So we put variations into uh, the parts we are we are applying in our converter as well as uh, the load side. As a, uh, and that 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 includes uh, statistical properties as well as uh, when let's say we map component by component. Uh, the uh, the stress they are seeing, we are putting them together, uh, seen from a reliability uh, block diagram, and try to analyze uh, the whole system. So what then comes out of such kind of systematic analysis are uh, many different things. Uh, it's, it comes something out of the road to current stress. Of course, we need to do simulation. Uh, something about uh, thermal loading. Uh, also, uh, are there any margins between, let's say, 
the worst case loading and uh, the weakest part of uh, our design as to do we have enough stress margin in order to overcome all all kinds of uh, situations. What then comes out of it is uh, uh, lifetime failure probability and uh, also, for example, uh, robustness of the system. How much overstress can it handle without uh, failing? And what could be were some of those uh, reliability diagrams here. Uh, uh, saying something or unreliability of uh, components and system. It could also be uh, thermographic analysis of uh, the thermal loading we have on, on our design. So the way uh, we analyze this in a, in a systematic way is uh, illustrated in, uh, in this uh, diagram here where we define what we call emission profile which is uh, the loading uh, the, uh, the the system is seeing and if we if we talk about the photovoltaic system and its inverter it's of course something to do with the irradiation it has something to do with the uh, 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 with the temperature because this is also affecting and that that is illustrated a little bit here so uh, when we have those uh, aspects uh, and we are for example assuming that uh, we are able to uh, 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 get as much power as possible out of uh, the panel, so we do maximum power contracting. Then we can calculate what uh, what kind of uh, power the inverter has uh, to deal with. Uh, the inverter we we model in the electric domain and characterize it and try to calculate what are is uh, the loss. We have done a design, uh, a thermal design, in order to ensure that uh, it's not overloaded. Uh, we we are putting in heat sinks and so on. And uh, in that context, then we have a model here uh, where uh, there is a relationship between the thermal model and uh, the loss because the losses will also be uh, junction temperature dependent. When we have done this uh, thermal model, uh, we can say something about how much the junction temperature is uh, varying. Uh, then we know there is a relationship between uh, temperature and uh, temperature variation. Uh, which, uh, 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 which both are affecting the lifetime of our components, uh, or it could be dependent, of course, of the characteristic. And in that context, we, we try to, over, for example, a year to, to calculate how many uh, cycles do we have and how, how is the junction temperature over time. And this is what is illustrated here, because our lifetime models, we say something about, uh, the, we say what the reliability is of our, uh, of our components, component by component, uh, will uh, come out with an equivalent value for the damage we are uh, putting on uh, each uh, component uh, in this one. This lifetime model can have come uh, based on uh, uh, testing. Uh, of uh, the components accelerated uh, test. So if the damage, uh, which is going to be accumulated over time, and so this is because we see that well, if that is approaching one, then we will assume and we are expecting the, uh, uh, the, the components to 100% be failing. However, uh, this, this is what we call a relatively uh, 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 straightforward uh, uh, modeling approach, but we also have to take into account a variation of uh, the parameters because uh, they will be uh, changed uh, uh, different depending on which one we have. So we are using Monte Carlo simulation to to get the variation of uh, of the uh, of the output of the uh, damage model, meaning that uh, only let's say fifty percent are expected after ten years to fail. Uh, maybe seventy five percent in total uh, will uh, be failed after 15 years. This is what uh, comes out of this uh, Monte Carlo simulation analysis. And uh, at component level, then we one by one have uh, its uh, reliability characteristic, uh, which we then uh, uh, put into a complete uh, system level analysis where we look at, okay, will the system fail operate if one component fail? Uh, yes, if that's the case, then uh, one component fail, all fail. Or will it still be able to operate if uh, one is failing? And then what comes out of it is the reliability of, uh, of the whole system. So this is a way uh, to do it. And you can see there are a lot to do with design, with uh, modeling, with, uh, with uh, uh, yeah, confidence level analysis, robustness analysis, as well as uh, finally come up with uh, some uh, metrics for it. So, so this is the way we do it. And this is what we call a three-step uh, modeling uh, approach.
So uh, this could, for example, be done on a PV inverter, like illustrated here, where we have a ray, we have a boost converter here to boost up uh, PV array, we have a boost converter to boost up the voltage. Then we do a DC to AC conversion with this uh, converter, and we, uh, and we also have an inverter control. The voltage here has to be higher than the peak voltage here to, uh, to keep control. Uh, here you can see the uh, uh, the hardware uh, which has been applied also to validate some of, some of the, the, the designs uh, where the power module is illustrated here and we have even access to the chips, you can see them here. Uh, we have a capacitors here and then we have some measurement circuits uh, put at this place. So this is a six kilowatt converter with uh, uh, filter, uh, DC link, uh, uh, a boost inductor, a DC link capacitor with this size, LCL filter running with this uh, switching frequency, this DC link voltage, and then 250 volt uh, RMS at uh, the output side. So if you look at it, uh, it seems from a practical perspective, which components are the, uh, are the most prone for failures? And so far, uh, the two most uh, critical components are the active power devices, can both be the diode and, uh, and the IDBT, but it's also the uh, capacitors we are applying in, in the system. And uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, the structure of a uh, power device, typically is so that here you have the diode chip, you have, a, uh, you have the IDBT chip, you have some bond wires to do connection, uh, then you have a, uh, some substrates here to, to connect to. Uh, you have a base plate uh, solar layer here, which is uh, of a different material. Then you have a base plate. Then you maybe have some uh, thermal grease to make connection to the heat sink. So you, you will assume the power goes from uh, this way and uh, downwards. And uh, what are the uh, uh, typical failure mechanism on a, on a power device are the uh, bond wires here because when they uh, conduct current, uh, then the heat here will uh, increase the temperature. And then because of the thermal expansion of the bond wire versus the uh, this uh, substrate part here, then over time, there will be a wear out. There will also be a wear out because of uh, the solar here, because again, there are thermal uh, expansion coefficients which are uh, different. And then over time, there is a limited uh, lifetime. But what is affecting that, this is the thermal cycling, uh, because uh, as, as I mentioned, but also the mean temperature and also the cycle uh, period we see uh, uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, cycle, the thermal cycles we have. And for the lifetime models, this is truly dependent on those three parameters here, delta uh, T, delta, uh, and then uh, Young as a delta T, T, and also the, uh, the, the period of uh, the, uh, of uh, the component. If you look at uh, the capacitors, which uh, we should be applying in the, in the DC, this, this is electrolyte, which is inside. And uh, uh, what can happen there is that uh, this become vaporized and uh, can affect uh, the lifetime. But uh, uh, what can also happen and that, that what we can see is that the uh, uh, leakage current uh, will uh, start increasing. And if the leakage current start increasing, then the voltage will, uh, uh, the, the power loss will increase. And then over time, the temperature will increase. And uh, then we will have a uh, way out. But what is also affecting the lifetime of this one is uh, the DC voltage we have across it. So if we come close to the limits, then it will not operate as long as that we are 30% below the, 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 the nominal value. So, so here, uh, the hotspot temperature as well as the DC voltage is uh, important in order to calculate uh, the lifetime of a system like this. So uh, if we take this as a, as a case, then uh, what we typically do is, in, if we follow this uh, process, we, we characterize, uh, we try to map the losses we have in the diodes and uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, 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 the switches. And here you can see uh, the turn on losses, the turn off losses at uh, two different temperatures. So this is uh, characterized for example, by using what we call double pulse testing, turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, uh, and then uh, measure the the, uh, the losses by measuring current and volts and calculate the power and thereby the uh, the energy losses. Uh, and uh, the conduction losses are also important. And you can see this is a IGPT we are seeing here. 
uh, for, for different temperatures. And you can see that uh, it's not uh, constant. Uh, the, temp uh, the losses are uh, increasing uh, as the, the temperature goes up, especially for the, for the higher current. So, so there is really a, a loop in terms of the temperature versus uh, the losses, which are important to, uh, to have in mind when doing this uh, characterization. When we have the losses, then we need to uh, 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 to characterize the uh, the thermal uh, characteristics, and for that we are typically applying uh, thermal impedances, which uh, can be uh, modeled like resistors and uh, capacitors. This this gives impedances, and then we will get impedances, for example, from junction to case uh, like this, where you have frequency and you have the thermal impedance. And from a case to amp, it uh, looks uh, like this. And of course, we can see if uh, the, the temperature variation has a, a, a high frequency, then uh, the, the thermal impedance is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is relatively low, and it becomes higher and higher as uh, the frequency uh, comes up. When that's done, uh, uh, then uh, we, we try to look at what is then the, the real loading of, uh, of uh, the system. This is what we call uh, the electrical loading, the available power and the extractive power in the, in the system. Uh, and there we assume that we are able to operate with a relatively efficient uh, maximum power point. You can now see here uh, that, uh, uh, that there are some uh, deviations. We cannot start immediately when some power is available. And then uh, this will then be, uh, let's say, translated in the simulation to certain IGBT junction temperatures for this uh, specific case. Now, remember, it's a six kilowatt system, and here is a two kilowatt system. Uh, but uh, you can see the, the, the junction temperature over time, and we are hitting a, a 50, close to 50 degrees C. Here, you can also see a comparison between the simulation and, uh, and uh, the measurement or the experiments, and they're relatively good. Uh, uh, so they're very much alike, so, uh, and we are using this setup to validate that. Then uh, this uh, uh, loading can, uh, the electron loading can be different compared with the other one. You can see this one here is maybe uh, one day, this one here is another day. Uh, where the irradiance is very, very uh, variant. And uh, just uh, uh, to illustrate this, uh, how, how this then looks for the, uh, for the uh, electrolytic capacitor, which we have also a model of in terms of thermal and a comparison between simulation and experiments. And we are able also relatively nice to, uh, to model this in, uh, between, so have the same uh, between modeling and, uh, and uh, experimentation. Then uh, we try to study this. This was more detailed for one day, but this we can expand for, for one year of uh, operation. And uh, here to the left, uh, you have what we call uh, the mission profile. This is the solar irradiance over one year and the ambient temperature. And uh, this can then be uh, uh, translated uh, into, uh, into uh, damage uh, of uh, the components. Uh, where you can see for the uh, power device, this gives in this case 11.1 uh, uh, times 2 minus 2 in, uh, in damage. So this is a relatively severe damage we have on the device in this uh, specific uh, case. And you can see the accumulated damage for the capacitor in this case is uh, 6.4. Uh, and if you take one divided by this, then you have the expected uh, lifetime uh, ideal, uh, ideal scene. But uh, we know that uh, the devices are different, so we have to put in some variations of uh, the, the parameters in different locations. Of course, done not uh, totally uh, blind, but uh, with uh, thoughts. So, uh, so then we will get, let's say, a lifetime distribution when we analyze component by component, uh, assessing it by a parameter variation, a distribution which uh, looks like this. Uh, where uh, typically we are uh, uh, using what we call a probability density function, and this can be uh, translated into what we call a viable function, because this can really uh, map almost everything uh, in terms of uh, mathematical uh, behavior. And uh, get this one here, and if we then integrate, then we have the, uh, uh, the failure distribution of, uh, of, of the system. And uh, this, this is also... Uh, 
illustrated here uh, that this is the unreliability function. In the beginning, we have no, so this is integration of this part here. In the beginning, we have no failure, but then over time failure will come. And then uh, after a certain, uh, let's say, number of years, we can expect, for example, 10% of the population has failed. And this is what we call the B10 lifetime of the uh, system. And then uh, over a long time, suddenly we hit uh, at the end, we hit 100% and then all components are expected uh, to fail. Now, this is for one component, uh, but uh, in the system you saw before, we had uh, four components, uh, so four active devices. And uh, we have to say that if one device fails, the converter fails. So, uh, so that means, of course, that there is a higher probability that the system will fail when we have four components compared with one. And uh, for that, we are using reliability block diagrams to characterize that. And uh, that is what we can see here when we do the calculations using the viable uh, distribution, uh, how much the uh, unreliability is uh, uh, yeah, increased or uh, uh, incre dependent on whether we have one component or we have uh, four components. So here are uh, some, uh, let's say, distributions uh, for uh, capacitors and uh, power devices where we have a certain uh, variation, uh, the lifetime distribution, uh, where we have tried to calculate through what uh, you saw before. And uh, what, you, what you can see here, this is uh, then the final uh, characteristic for this inverter you saw for one uh, active device. And here you have for one uh, capacitor. Uh, and uh, then here you can see if we have four power modules, and here you can see if we have uh, four power enough power devices and then one capacitor, and then we get uh, this characteristic, final characteristic of the system for the for the whole inverter. So if you look at this, you can uh, absolutely clearly conclude that uh, the reliability in this case is uh, dictated by uh, by the capacitor. And if you want to increase the reliability of uh, this system here, you have to. Uh, improve the uh, capacitor performance and so in increase the lifetime on this one. And this can, of course, be done, for example, by adding more capacitors uh, to uh, the system. But in this case here, with this design, uh, we would expect that 10% of uh, the population uh, will fail within uh, four years. And I would say, seen from a, a system reliability perspective, uh, this is not acceptable. Okay, so uh, what other uh, parameters are, uh, could, could vary beyond what we have uh, been discussing here when we talk about uh, reliability? And uh, you, you can, of course, see we are analyzing the, uh, uh, the systems uh, like a time record, if we can say so. Uh, and uh, and uh, the question is, of course, <clears throat> how, how, uh, with which resolution do we need to analyze systems uh, like this, because if we have to analyze it uh, with seconds of uh, resolution over uh, one year and do uh, th this calculation here uh, so uh, so many times, it will of course take time. So we are of course interested to also to have some ideas about what is the time resolution needed uh, in order to have a good representation of uh, the lifetime and thereby being able to uh, analyze also very complicated uh, systems. So uh, here are fundamentally uh, two situations for a PV system. One is uh, a clear day, another one is uh, a cloudy day where clouds are coming and go. And uh, what you can see here uh, is the impact if we have one minute, 10 minutes, uh, one hour resolution uh, where the, uh, the, uh, the, the red is the real one, and uh, the blue one is what uh, we get when we do with this uh, uh, reduced uh, resolution. And if you look at it uh, uh, for, for the irradiance, uh, cloudy, uh, normally no problem, uh, but for uh, a, a, a cloudy day with a lot of variation, you can see we'll get a, a lot of uh, uh, by some mistakes in our assumptions, uh, no doubt about this. And also, uh, if you look at the thermal stress pro profile, uh, one minute, uh, 10 minutes, one hour, the mistakes are uh, way small, while the mistakes are more significant if uh, we are much more significant if we go to 10 minutes and, and one hour of analysis uh, in terms of uh, time resolution. 
So uh, this can also be illustrated a little bit here uh, for, for this uh, specific uh, case, cloudy day operation. If uh, then uh, one, one of the things we do, we count how many cycles we have of uh, small uh, cycles, a little bit bigger cycles and bigger cycles at, uh, at certain uh, temperatures. And this is what we call rainfall counting. And uh, if we have one minute resolution, we can see that we have uh, many cycles at uh, different levels. If we take 10 minutes, you can see our, the number of cycles is really going down. And then uh, we will not see this in our, our reliability analysis. And if we take one hour, we almost hardly see any, uh, let's say, variation. And uh, we will thereby be cheated in, in our analysis if we are not taking that more into account. So uh, just to illustrate here, and uh, things will uh, depend a lot on uh, on uh, on uh, on the variation. But if we take a certain case uh, uh, like the uh, like the cloudy day, uh, and what is then the calculated uh, damage for 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 this case? And uh, we have a case with resolution of one hour, thirty minutes, ten minutes, five minutes. One minute, uh, one second. You can see there is a significant difference in in uh, in in, in uh, this case. But while when we are taking, for example, uh, the uh, uh, the clear sky day, we could uh, easily run uh, with very high precision uh, with much faster time pace. But uh, recommendation here is use high resolution uh, of the mission profile uh, when data is available and when the computational burden is acceptable. But if we are using a lower resolution, uh, we, we should especially look at uh, the profile before we make this uh, decision. Another uh, uh, thing uh, which can vary uh, in the analysis is uh, the generator, so the PV uh, generator, because uh, this can also uh, damage over time. Uh, we can have a uh, soiling, we can have uh, Discolorization. We can also have a degradation because uh, of potential induced degradation. And uh, a simplified way to represent this is that, and also in the data sets, that the uh, let's say uh, the panels are seeing degradation over time. Uh, if we have uh, panels in Denmark, maybe uh, where I'm sitting, we have maybe only have 0.15 percent. Uh, degradation uh, per year while in Arizona because the temperature is higher then we have one percent degradation over year and that means of course that uh, we are losing power production over time and that will count positive for the PV inverter because it's not seeing the same amount of power that we expected in uh, the future and the question is of course how much will that uh, then affect it and uh, this we have uh, tried to analyze for example for uh, Arizona, uh, where you have a, a full year, and uh, the blue, uh, the red one is illustrating if uh, we are not. This is the temperature, uh, the mean temperature of uh, the system in Arizona in in, in Werther. and uh, the red one indicates if we do not take the degradation of the panel into account after five years, uh, and then uh, if we take it into account, and you can see there are significant difference in the, in the temperature. And uh, if we then do the uh, uh, calculation here, so the PV array uh, degra without degradation, uh, now with degradation, then we expect a lifetime of uh, six years. But if we take into as a B10 lifetime of six years, but if we take into uh, account PV array degradation with a relatively high degradation per year, we will double the lifetime of the PV inverter. So that's, that's of course worth to have in mind, not just blinded. Uh, uh, to put it in uh, into the system, uh, but but really take this into account. Okay, so uh, the two last thing is uh, more as so, uh, uh, to so this was also a little bit about control. Can we do anything in in that uh, respect? And one is impact on the mission profile, and then also more mission profile oriented uh, control. As a, what we can say in general is that uh, very dependent on where we are putting it, the mission profile will be different. Uh, in the desert, dry, right? Uh, in Denmark, uh, cold and uh, humid. Uh, if it's in the ocean, very humid climate. And uh, then some, somewhere in between, it could be uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, parts of uh, Chile, but you also have very desert areas. I know this for sure. So. Uh, so what we can say is that uh, if we look at the uh, uh, mission profile uh, characteristic for Olbo, you can see uh, this is illustrated here that uh, the temperature is going 
much up and down, dependent on the season. The irradiance also, while if we go to Arizona, we have almost the same irradiance. The ambient temperature is going uh, uh, not so much up and down, and it's also higher. So if we look at the accumulated uh, damage, whether it's one or the other place, uh, you can see here uh, the accumulated damage uh, in, uh, in Denmark for power device and for the capacitor, this is around three and 1.5. While if we go to, I said times uh, 10 time, times minus two, but if you go to, uh, uh, to Arizona, uh, you can see that uh, the device is uh, around four times more loaded. It will accumulate four times more uh, damage. And uh, it's almost the same also for the, uh, for the Arizona. So now it's written three, so it's more than uh, three times. And that uh, at the end will of course also if affect uh, significantly the, uh, the, the, the lifetime of uh, the system. So uh, location specific uh, design uh, is uh, way, way much worth uh, to consider. Then uh, the, uh, uh, another uh, approach is of course also uh, uh, yeah, to, to look at where is the most damage of uh, the converters. Uh, uh, and uh, can we maybe change uh, the emission profile, so change the control so uh, when we have most damage, then we, uh, we are not operating at uh, this uh, full power, but maybe let's say curtail a little bit uh, the power uh, production, even though we have more available. Uh, of course, if we do so, uh, this can maybe be a, a penalty for the, uh, for the owner of uh, the PV system, but uh, Maybe not, because there can also be saved money on, on the reliability of uh, the inverter itself. And uh, one, one approach could be that uh, uh, this is the, let's say, the characteristic of uh, a clear, clear sky, sky day, right? Uh, where we have a peak power here. Uh, and uh, we are extract. We know we have a very good maximum power contract, so we can extract uh, uh, very much all the time but we also know in in this area here typically we will have have high temperature as a, we will also have high loading of the system so this is where we really see the peak uh, loading of uh, the system so what we could try to do was uh, uh, to analyze what is then the effect of let's say curtailing a little bit the power at uh, the peak uh, we would have a, a loss uh, in terms of energy yield uh, but this will maybe only be a small loss uh, be because it's only the peak. But on the other hand, then we get a, a longer uh, lifetime in, in the system. So uh, again, uh, Arizona is uh, taking as an example uh, where you have the uh, solar irradiance, you have here the ambient temperature. So let, let us assume that uh, we uh, say, okay, uh, in Arizona, we will never operate higher than 80% in the, the system as a, uh, and what is then the impact uh, compared with if we operate uh, full power all the time. And uh, what you can see here is the mean junction temperature uh, without doing anything. And uh, the blue one is uh, doing something and you, you can absolutely both see, uh, uh, so the mean junction temperature, hotspot uh, temperature will really uh, be lower because we make this uh, active uh, decision. So uh, what then happens uh, with it is that uh, you can see here the, uh, the lifetime uh, of uh, the components if, uh, if we say the power limitation is uh, zero and then we 95 as a 5% uh, less, 10% less. And what you can see then is the component uh, lifetime uh, both for the, for the capacitor and for the power device. And uh, you can significantly see that if we go from 100% uh, to 80%, the power device is expected to uh, live uh, 20 years longer, while the capacitor is not seeing the same amount of, uh, uh, let's say, advantage. And uh, so, so no doubt that, uh, let's say, if the system should operate a certain uh, target life, then this is the one this is a way also to ensure that uh, the lifetime is what uh, we we want it uh, to be. So uh, uh, here uh, is then also illustrated uh, the consequence if we do such thing in, uh, for example, in Arizona. And so we uh, 
we did, we we uh, we for example uh, say that 87.5 percent uh, this is the maximum power because then we get a lifetime uh, of uh, component lifetime of at least uh, 20 years then what do we lose in terms of energy yield and in this case we will lose seven uh, percent of uh, the whole energy yield for the for the PV uh, production. But then our system will uh, be able to operate as the PV inverter system will be able to operate uh, twenty years instead of the six seven years we have been uh, looking at uh, before. Yes, so uh, this is uh, moving uh, to an end. So uh, in respect to uh, 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 reliability in uh, PV inverter systems. Uh, we have to say that uh, we uh, we have to understand the component themselves, devices, electrolytic uh, capacitors. They are the, the, the critical components, but uh, th there can also be uh, uh, other components which can be uh, critical in terms of lifetime. For example, the fans, which are mechanical based, or the the gate drivers. Uh, and if we want to increase uh, as a uh, as you lower the uh, cost of energy, this is very really important to understand. But then we also know that uh, uh, long-term degradation uh, are truly uh, done because of the thermal stress. Uh, and in order to understand this, uh, we, we need to do reliability modeling and we need to do thermal stress modeling, lifetime estimation, and of course, uh, uh, system assessment uh, in, in the whole thing. If we then want to design according to a certain uh, reliability, uh, then uh, we have to understand. We can. Uh, we have to understand the emission profiles, the loading profile, but uh, we can also uh, uh, take into account the degradation. Uh, we can also, as so if we really want to uh, increase uh, cost of energy. A decreased cost of energy. There can also be the uh, the the thinking of oversizing the the PV array to have more maximum power production. And then uh, at the end, what I was talking about was uh, also the importance of mission profile variation as well as the ability to control uh, the power we are uh, we are handling. For example, not. Uh, as a clipping the power, not uh, operates uh, at 100 percent, but operate at 90 percent, and in that way uh, uh, increase the reliability of uh, the whole system. Yes, so here are some papers, uh, maybe not uh, 100 percent updated, but some papers which are supporting this. There are many others who have been working uh, in this field, uh, no doubt, but this is just to support uh, uh, the presentation I have here today. So, and I, I want to. Thank Jonghen and uh, Araya for providing a lot of those uh, data here. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to me, and I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. Mm -hmm. that you might have. Thank you very much, Freda, for your interesting presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. Everything you have for today for us. Uh, we have now some time for questions. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can write it on the chat. I have some chats. Um, yes, yeah, we have a few questions from some people. Jorn uh, Kelly uh, said that he would like to know about any experience adding a steering engine to the PV system. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I, I have to say I have no uh, really uh, experience with a, with a Sterling engine, so I will only be uh, guessing if I'm uh, trying to contribute <laughs> to uh, to this uh, question. Uh, so yeah, so I have to say I cannot, uh, I don't have any experience in that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Carlos Salgado uh, said that it is now that this PV system uh, don't have inertia capacity, mm -hmm. capability of capacity, uh, which affects the stability of frequency and voltage. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what is, what is the best type of converter, the follower inverter or the grid forming? Oh, yeah, uh, this, this, is a, this is a very good question. And I think this is a question we, there are many people who are trying to find out uh, what is the best thing to do. I would say uh, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, make uh, 
uh, a PV plant to be grid forming, right? And so we can, uh, and uh, uh, to be grid forming, we should maybe have a little bit extra storage capacity or we should uh, curtail uh, the power to uh, be able to provide power when, when needed. Uh, but, uh, but we do not have a, a, a clear answer yet. Uh, how much grid forming, how much grid follower do we need in certain locations? And uh, this, this is still going to be, uh, to be discussed uh, because uh, uh, if everything works grid forming, then there can be a high risk that we are not utilizing the, uh, the capacity we have in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wind and uh, the PV. So, uh, so, so, so there will be a balance between what we extract out of renewables and then uh, what we need to uh, to have of uh, grid forming capacity to have a stable uh, power grid. And uh, so, so both both are very important to study, seen from a PV uh, technology perspective. Thank you very much. I know we are on the time, but I would like to ask you one more question. And um, it's related to your opinion regarding how drastic weather conditions due to climate change can affect the performance of the reliability of this uh, kind of systems. You have done a very interesting uh, study for a long yeah. period, but what about the new drastic con uh, conditions of the weather? Yeah. Uh, I, I, as a higher temperature, uh, if that's what we are going to face, and this this is what we are going to face, this will affect the reliability and uh, reduce the reliability of of uh, of the power plants. Uh, no, no doubt about this. Maybe also we will see uh, as a more dry season, more humid humid seasons, as a maybe more humidity. This will also affect uh, the reliability. Mm -hmm. So, so these are absolutely also parameters which are worth to study. And so, how much more will it uh, will it uh, be? Let's say if the average temperature is going to rise, let's say 1.5 degree uh, within. Uh, as a, this is very average because this is very location dependent. But if we say it's going to increase uh, 1.5 degree, what is then the impact? And there are significant impact on, on the reliability also mm -hmm. when we are going to see that. So there are more to study Great, and there are more to take into account in yeah. our uncertainty analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rodrigo, do you want to say something else? Oh, your microphone, Rodrigo, sorry. Give me one second. No. Try. Okay, thank you. No, Fred, thank you very much. No. Really an honor to, to receive your input for the Chilean context. You know that we are in, in Chile in a renewal energy revolution. We want to be 100% renewable, hopefully. Uh, at least we have 100, 100 times the potential in what we need in, in the country. So it's really yeah. a big opportunity for us. And so, um, I have only one question, very general. If you can make your vision about the how to the, how will evolve the power systems in a balance between decentralized energy solutions with high participation of converters and also centralized solutions. We are facing this uh, only to give you some numbers. We have around thirty gigawatts of installed capacity. And now we have around two gigawatts of decentralized at, at distribution level, but we expect to move to 10 gigawatts. And mm -hmm. in, on the other part, we also expect an evolution, but the, the forces are that they are um, that move to be uh, more or less comparable. And I, I wonder if you can give some insights about uh, mm -hmm. what are the challenges if, with, with, with this combination. Well, uh, I, I, uh, there are a few challenges, as in general, to operate uh, the, the system. But what, what typically will be argued to be the challenge is the lack of inertia, right? Also, uh, the big systems I think you refer to, you already have as uh, the big power plants. They have a, they have a relatively large uh, system inertia. 
certain number of seconds, you are able to keep uh, the, uh, the full power. And uh, this capability will uh, not be so easy to, uh, to achieve by, uh, by, by the renewable uh, part. But, uh, but to a certain degree, this, this is solvable by, by putting in uh, uh, components uh, with, which uh, are able to provide uh, some of the, uh, the same performance, as well as inertia can be emulated uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, distributed uh, generated uh, system. I think this is uh, maybe where I see the, uh, the, the biggest uh, challenge seen from a power system uh, operation that uh, this is not there and you have to be able to uh, accept or you have to be able to analyze whether your system is able to, uh, to cope with that. You have a very long distance, I think, in, uh, in your country uh, from north to south. So uh, the grid is maybe not that strong either. Uh, and maybe it is, I can be wrong, I can't remember. But, uh, and uh, that, that of course will also give you uh, uh, some issues uh, to uh, transport, let's say, power from areas where the uh, renewable uh, uh, generation is relatively strong. Uh, I guess they are more good to the north, but I can be wrong. And maybe in the middle you have most uh, population, and then to the south maybe not so much uh, population. So, but uh, the strength of uh, the grid can also be an issue. But uh, uh, the strength of the grid, I I think. Uh, is maybe not as a have more distributed innovation. I think this is also possible to uh, to uh, to solve this. But I think the the biggest challenge will be the inertia you're sque squeezing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for your comments as well. Uh, we are closing now our session. Thank you very much, Frede, again for your support to this initiative. Um, we hope to see you soon in, in another uh, speech. Thank you very much to all the attendees. So we will send an email for future invitations in the future. Thank you okay. very much. Keep in touch. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye.